the possibility of a military confrontation between two nuclear-armed adversaries is harder now than it's probably been since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer and this week we are talking about Russia and NATO and whether they'll ever be able to talk to each other again. The war in Ukraine sped up the breakdown of an already fraught relationship between Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Western world. Both sides are digging in for the long haul. Finland has officially joined NATO. Russia just walked away from its last nuclear arms agreement with Washington. Putin's diplomatic efforts, or lack thereof, with the West and vice versa have been pointing all in one direction, escalation. So how does it end? Is this the beginning of a new Cold War? It's probably worse than that, no? And where does that put countries like Brazil and India who have economic and diplomatic ties with everybody? I'm talking with Ivo Dalder. He's president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and former US ambassador to NATO. And later we'll look back at NATO's founding and the history of the Warsaw Pact. But first, a year ago, Vladimir Putin was a lonely man. The Russian president took extreme measures to isolate himself during the pandemic, wasn't seen in public for months. This is what it looked like when he met with his security advisors. And who could forget that shiny white, ridiculously long table? But even a former KGB agent can't stay in total isolation forever. Autocratic leaders need friends too, especially ones in the middle of a long, expensive war. So who is standing by Russia? Who are Putin's friends right now? Well, first, they're the loyalists. They're the ones who voted against the UN resolution condemning Russia's special military operation since the beginning. Belarus, Syria, North Korea, and Eritrea. Now that's what I call a party. Mali and Nicaragua joined the gang. They heard it was fun on a similar resolution for the one year anniversary. And that's it. Next, there's China. The friend Russia really, really wants the world to know is on its side. Xi Jinping's first trip abroad in the pandemic was to Moscow, and the Kremlin rolled out the red carpet. Putin even personally walked Xi to his car at the end of the summit. How's that for hospitality? Xi and Putin say they have a friendship without limits, but China has resisted giving Russia direct support, like troops or weapons, for its war in Ukraine. Putin also has some friends close to home. His first foreign trip after launching the invasion was in June to Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. In fact, in the second half of 2022, Putin traveled to all five former Soviet countries in Central Asia to shore up Russia's major sphere of influence. There are the friends a little farther away, like Iran. Putin met with Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei in Iran last July, and a few weeks later, Russia received its first batch of Iranian-made drones. And then there are countries on the fence like India, Brazil, and South Africa with strong economic ties to both the Kremlin and NATO. And they're trying to walk a tightrope between the two sides, calling for peace, but not openly criticizing Russia. So far, they've all refused to participate in Western sanctions. And while they technically haven't supported Russia's invasion, their money sure does. Then again, so do the Europeans when they buy Russian oil, food, and diamonds. So despite the West's best efforts to isolate Russia, Moscow still has plenty of international partners, allies, and friends to lean on when times get tough. And as sanctions keep fuel prices high, and global inflation too, who knows how many more it will have a year from now. And what does all this mean for Russia's enemies, namely the G7 and NATO? To find out, I'm talking with President of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Ivo Dahl. Ambassador Ivo Dalder joins us. Good to see you. Hey, great to be here, Ian. So much to talk about uh, NATO to start, since you've got a little bit of experience there. Uh, how significant, not just symbolically, but in real operational terms, is it that Finland is now a member over 800 new miles of border of NATO directly with Russia? It's extraordinarily significant. It's probably the most significant new member to, of NATO at least since uh, Poland joined, but possibly even since the end of the Cold War, when you really think about it. 
Here is if you are a Russian military planner, you all of a sudden have to think about a border that you didn't really worry about, 830 miles long, twice as long as any other part of the border uh, uh, that Russia has with current NATO members. Uh, it now needs to defend that border. It needs to think about how do we make sure that NATO doesn't come anywhere near some of the most important strategic assets that Russia has in the Kola Peninsula, way up north. It is a submarine base. It has nuclear weapons uh, capabilities there. And they're now within striking distance uh, of NATO ground forces in Finland. So that's one big thing. Second big thing is that Finland is an incredibly capable military. These are people who have been armed in their neutrality. They've never skimmed on the ability to defend their territory. And they've been part of NATO military operations in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, uh, in Libya, around the world uh, in many ways for the past 30 years. They're pretty integrated. Their capabilities uh, are, are real. They have a ground force that is not only uh, very capable today, but they can massively uh, bring in reserves over time. So you're adding real military capability uh, to the alliance. And then finally, one of the most exposed elements of NATO are the Baltic countries uh, who are uh, close to, to Russia, small, not very uh, large when it comes to their own military capability. Well, right across the Baltic Sea now has Finland. And so the Baltic Sea is becoming a NATO lake with St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, the only Russian uh, entry points, but the rest of it is now all NATO, particularly once Sweden, of course, joins. Now, um, when I think about uh, the relationship between NATO and Russia today, we can't quite just call it a Cold War. I mean, the, the economics, of course, have been cut off, of the gas is no longer flowing, the oligarchs uh, have been sanctioned, the, the sovereign assets of the Russian Central Bank have been frozen. What do we call that? I mean, what, what is the state of relations between NATO and Russia today? It's adversarial to the point that Russia now sees NATO as its enemy, and frankly, NATO sees Russia as an enemy. Not just a threat, but an enemy. A country that is determined to find a way to exert influence through use of military force, possibly including against NATO territory. That's something that we haven't thought about uh, in the NATO parlance since the end of the Cold War. And frankly, even during the Cold War, the likelihood of a Russian military attack, certain towards the end uh, of the Cold War, was discounted. But here we see it in real life, every day, Russian military forces crossing a border in order to, to enlarge their own territory imperialism and aggression in real time. So the relationship is not one of partnership. When I was NATO ambassador in 2010, we talked about the potential of a strategic partnership with Russia. No one in NATO today talks about the potential of a strategic partnership with Russia. It is the most important military threat, and that's very different. What we're saying is that the military confrontation today of the global order, leaving aside any other threats, is absolutely not just as bad as when the Cold War was in place, but in some ways it's worse. In some ways it's more dangerous. Yeah. Because during the Cold War, since the late, sort of mid to late 1960s, there was an attempt by both the United States and the Soviet Union to find ways to coexist, to talk to each other. There was arms control, there was the hotline, there were a whole series of agreements that said, let's manage our military competition in a way that we know that the only reason we will ever have a war is if somebody decides that that's what they want to do. No accidents, no escalation, none of that. We even had arms control agreements. We had a European conference on security and cooperation that led in 1975 to the Helsinki Final Act that defined the relationships of all countries in Europe and, uh, and North America. All of that's gone. Russia has just walked away from the last arms control agreement that existed, the START agreement uh, that limits the nuclear warheads that the United States and, and Russia are, uh, are allowed to, uh, to deploy. Russia has just said that they will no longer tell the United States when it tests ballistic missiles. We've been doing that for 50 years, we're telling each other, because we want to know if they're testing a ballistic missile that is not an attack. 
that's all gone. So it's a very, very dangerous military situation in which deep distrust of each other, the possibility of a military confrontation between two nuclear-armed nuclear armed adversaries is larger now than it's probably been since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Russia just announced that they're going to put tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus that hadn't existed since the days of the Cold War. In the context of all of these fail-safes that are being taken away, this does feel like an intentionally endangering move. Yeah, clearly Putin is uh, becoming used to rattling the, his nuclear saber in ways that, frankly, we haven't seen for a very long time. Maybe since Khrushchev was banging his shoe uh, at the UN, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The way that Putin talks and the people around Putin talk about nuclear weapons, Medvedev, his deputy uh, national security uh, chief, uh, talks about nuclear weapons as if they're the same uh, as conventional weapons with just a bigger bang for the buck. It's really worrisome. The actual movement of nuclear weapons potentially to Belarus, uh, as long as they remain under firm Russian control, I actually have less concern about. I don't think that is leading to uh, the first step to nuclear war. Uh, I worry about whether the Belarusians are going to be trained to use those weapons, but even so, we have NATO countries that train to use nuclear weapons even though they don't have them. So I'm not particularly concerned about the technical and tactical details. I'm worried about the strategic impact. What are you trying to do here, Mr. Putin? Are you trying to send a warning that we, the Russians, are willing to defend our gains in Ukraine by threatening and possibly using nuclear weapons. That I'm worried about. I think it's real. I think uh, he's trying to do it to deter the West, and he's been very successful in doing so, so far. The West has provided arms, intelligence, training, but not troops. Now, there is, of course, an enormous difference between the way the collective West feels about Putin and everyone else feels about the West, everyone else feels about Russia, feels about the war. I mean, India is a strong member of the Quad, partner in many ways of the West, but their relationship with Russia is virtually identical to China's relationship with Russia. South Africa's perspective is very aligned. Brazil, Mexico. So, I mean, as soon as you get out of the collective West, suddenly it's not talk about war crimes. It's not talk about Ukraine has to be redressed no matter what. It's these sanctions are hurting us. We need to keep doing business with the largest country geographically in the world with all their resources, and, and you guys are hurting us. What, what do we do about that? It's a real problem, and I think uh, people in, in the White House and in uh, the chancelleries and the Elysees and other places are spending a lot of time thinking about how do we change not only the narrative, because the narrative is important, and clearly the Russians were very good at saying everything that you're suffering as a consequence of this war, higher fuel prices, less food, and therefore higher food, pri uh, food prices, and everything else that came from it is because of the sanctions that the West has inflicted, as opposed to, well, wait a minute, where, why did these sanctions get inflicted and uh, imposed in the first place? Because you invaded another country. And I think the, the West sort of believing that because they had a pretty darn good vote in the UN General Assembly, 140 plus countries. In condemning the invasion. Condemning the invasion. But and, not in supporting the sanctions. No, but in condemning the invasion, yeah. they thought, well, everybody, of course, understands this is a terrible thing and we have to do something. We're not going to war directly, so therefore we are uh, imposing sanctions. And we, by the way, we will uh, allow, of course, food and other uh, agricultural products to be uh, exported. Uh, uh, we didn't think that people would see the sanctions as the problem as opposed to the invasion. And in fact, that is the reality. The reality is when you're the man or a woman on the street in Brasilia or in Johannesburg or frankly in Delhi and your fuel and food prices have gone up, you're going to say, wait a minute, where's the problem here? It must be the West, it's not Russia. Uh, and, and so trying to figure out a way to start talking about this in a, in, in a different way is one part of it. But the second part of it is it, it puts pressure on, on finding uh, a solution to this conflict. Uh, and it's not a surprise that at the G20 meeting in Indonesia, the intervention by the Ukrainian president was to lay out a 10-point peace plan. And there is a question at what point does military 
confrontation start to compete more effectively with diplomatic engagement uh, and, and in terms of how to talk about this war. We're not quite there yet. There's a pending Ukrainian offensive. But it offensive. feels closer, doesn't it? It does feel closer. Yeah. I think people know that the war is starting to, uh, to hurt uh, Im the image, but more importantly, that there isn't a lot of juice left in the war in the sense that there is enough materiel and enough manpower to continue with the high intensity that we currently have. Lower intensity, probably for months, if not years, possibly even decades. After all, this war at a low intensity point has started in 2014. Right. It's been going on for yeah. uh, almost nine years. But that, at, at that point, you start thinking about, well, is there a way that we can start talking about it? Today, no, can't say that. Ivo Dalder, thanks for joining. Always a pleasure, Ian. Russia and NATO have been sworn enemies for about 75 years, but could there be a time in the distant future when Russia is a friend, even a partner? That's not happening anytime soon. Certainly not while Putin is in charge. But if history is any indication, it's not such a crazy idea. NATO has a precedent of absorbing its enemies. I'm talking, of course, about the Warsaw Pact, the 1955 military alliance between the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries. Don't remember the Warsaw Pact? Well, we're going back to the beginning of the Cold War. World War II has just ended. Harry Como was at the top of the charts, don't know who that is. And the Iron Curtain went up almost immediately. And cover. The Soviet Union was flexing its muscles in Eastern Europe, so US leaders created the Marshall Plan in 1947, which gave aid to friendly countries to help rebuild after the war. But in 1948, the Soviet Union helped topple the democratic government of Czechoslovakia and cut supply routes to West Berlin. The West needed something stronger than the Marshall Plan to counter Soviet expansion. So in 1949, a dozen countries from Western Europe and North America formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And in 1955, when NATO let West Germany in and allowed it to rearm, things got tense. Less than two weeks after West Germany joined, the Eastern Bloc nations signed the Warsaw Pact, which like NATO, bound countries to come to each other's defense if attacked by an outside power. There was also a convenient internal security component that allowed the Soviets to use the pact to squash popular uprisings in Hungary and Poland and in Czechoslovakia. But when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, so did the Warsaw Pact, and soon former enemies became allies. By 2009, the pact's entire western flank was part of the NATO alliance. So yes, NATO formed in opposition to the Soviets and continues to fight Russian expansion in Eastern Europe to this day. And yes, one of Putin's main reasons for the war in Ukraine is he thinks NATO presence on the Russian border is an existential threat, or at least so he says. But allegiances between nations are constantly changing, and the enemies of today could be the allies of tomorrow. Maybe there's a future where NATO's Secretary General and the Russian President are clinking glasses of chilled vodka. Nazdorovia. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, or even if you don't, but you're thinking, hey, I want to be part of an alliance. How come no one wants collective security with me? We've got you covered. Take a minute to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G Zero Daily.